This video is sponsored by Brilliant. When it comes to solving crime, there's a lot more math, physics, and statistics going on in the background than you may realize. And this is needed for things like making predictions or reconstructing a crime scene. And sometimes the underlying analysis can be as simple as looking at the outcomes of a coin toss. If I took a coin out of my pocket and I flipped it 10 times and every single time it landed heads, what would you think? Would you think it's a fair coin or maybe it's a little bit biased or weighted? Well, you'd definitely be right to have your suspicions because I mean the chance of that happening for a fair coin is about one in a thousand, but hey, it could still happen. Well, statisticians use something called hypothesis testing to determine the odds of some hypothesis being true. Like, what are the odds of this coin being fair based on the outcome of a certain number of flips? Because even if you got 100 heads in a row, there's still no guarantee that the coin is biased. But as you can see, the chance that it's biased clearly changes based on the outcome. Now, this type of analysis was actually used to sentence Kristen Gilbert to prison a few decades ago. Kristen Gilbert was a nurse who was often known for being the first person in the hospital to recognize when a patient was going into cardiac arrest, to which she would then give the necessary medicine while an emergency team arrived, and this saved several lives. But suspicion started to grow due to certain factors, and people began to think that maybe she was inducing cardiac arrests in these patients so she could then catch it and, quote, save the day. And thus, an investigation was started which involved the statistician being brought in. Now, what this person did was looked at the number of deaths that occurred while Kristen was on duty versus how many occurred when she was not at the hospital, and they compared these numbers to see if there was an obvious difference. Now, if one or two more deaths happened on her watch, that could just be a coincidence. It doesn't prove anything. So how many more deaths would need to occur for us to have sufficient evidence that something criminal was going on? Well, now we need statistics to answer this question. And using hypothesis testing, the statistician determined that there was less than a 1 in 100 million chance that that many deaths occurred just by chance on her watch. Meaning it was almost a guarantee that something criminal was going on. Although this was not the determining factor in her sentence, since again it's just probability, this did help provide enough evidence that she was guilty and she's currently serving life in prison. Now another interesting use of math to solve crime, which actually isn't based on a true story as far as I know, has to do with looking at the tangent line to a curve. So let's say you come across a crime scene and notice bike tracks going in each direction. The question we want to answer is can we determine which way the bicycle is traveling and can we determine how large the bike is just from the tracks? And the answer is yes to both of these. Now if the cyclist moved in a perfectly straight line and left these tracks, we're out of luck. But since that probably would not happen, we can solve this mystery. Since bikes have two tires, we're going to see two sets of tracks. So it could look like this if they had to make some weird turn. But just to help really analyze the differences, I'm going to use this more chaotic set of tracks found on Brilliant site to help the visualizations. The first question we need to answer is which of the two sets of tracks is the back tire? Well, think about how a bike works. The front tire always points in the direction of motion at that instant in time. If the bike looks like this and you start pedaling, the direction of motion would be in this direction, the way the front tire is pointed. So when we look at the tracks created by the front tire, the tangent line points in the direction the bike was going at that instant. The back tire, on the other hand, is fixed. It cannot rotate. And the way it's fixed, it is always pointing at the front tire. This means that if we draw a tangent line at any point on the back tire's tracks, it should intersect the front tire's tracks since at that point in time, the back tire was again pointing at the front tire. So looking back at this picture, clearly the dash line cannot be the back tire since a tangent line here, for example, does not intersect the other curve or what would be the front tire. So the solid curve must be the back tire since at any point I can draw a tangent line that intersects the other curve. Okay, but we still don't know which way the bike is moving, but here's how we're gonna find that out. Again, the tangent line to the back tire will always intersect the front tire's tracks, but the length of that line has significance. It's the distance from the back tire to the front. Since the bike obviously does not change size as it moves, that length does not change. So the line segment that is tangent to the back tire's tracks and intersects the front should always be the same distance. This means we know the bike was moving to the right. To see that, if we picked a point, then drew a tangent line towards the right, we'd get a length. Pick another point, and we could find an intersection point yielding the same length. Same with another point, and so on. 
You won't find that going the other way though. So there you go. The bike was traveling to the right. The solid line is the back tire's tracks and the bike is about this long from the back to the front tire. So that's a lot of information from just two sets of tracks. And now if you were asked what the tire tracks of a bike moving in a circle look like, you'd know it's not this, but rather this, where the front tire always points in the direction of motion and the back tire points towards the front tire such that the length of the line segment is the same as the distance of separation of the wheels. Next up, traffic is a complicated thing. Maybe you've seen this animation that shows that traffic can be caused by just one person cutting off another. Now, you may not think that much goes into solving the problem of traffic besides adding lanes here and there or controlling freeway on-ramps, for example. But oh man, there is a lot of analysis that goes into traffic. For one, traffic engineering is itself an entire branch of civil engineering. But also go look at the Traffic Flow Wikipedia page. It's about as long as World War II's Wikipedia page, and you'll come across things like single vehicle dynamics, methods of analysis, the Hamilton-Jacobi partial differential equation, three-phase traffic theory, kinetic wave model, merge models, traffic bottleneck, and way more. So yeah, not as simple as one may think. But we're gonna take it down and just look at how bad one single event can be in terms of traffic. Let's take a one lane road where a tree falls. And for this problem, there is no going around or doing a U-turn or anything like that. Now let's say on this road, the flow rate is 10 cars per minute. So every minute, 10 more cars build up in front of this fallen tree. Then let's say on average, the cars are spaced five meters apart as they sit in the traffic jam. This means the physical line of cars is increasing at 50 meters per minute. Now, once the tree is removed, what happens? Well, the first person starts moving, then there is a delay just due to reaction time until the second person starts to move. This repeats for the third, then the fourth, and so on. If we assume a reaction time of two seconds on average for each driver, that means the front of this traffic jam is moving backwards at a rate of one car every two seconds. And since they're spaced five meters apart, that line is moving at 2.5 meters per second or 150 meters per minute. This is known as the leading edge propagation speed. But note that cars are still arriving to this traffic jam at the same rate of 10 cars per minute, which we said increases the line's length at 50 meters per minute. That means the front of the jam is approaching the back at a rate of 100 meters per minute. If let's say the line was one kilometer long when the tree was finally cleared, that means it would take 10 minutes for the traffic jam to be entirely cleared and the front line to catch the back. And in that time, the last car to encounter the traffic would find it 1,500 meters from where the tree fell. So even once the tree is cleared, there's someone several kilometers away that is going to encounter the tail end of the traffic over a kilometer or nearly a mile from where the tree fell. But the crazy thing is if 29 cars arrive per minute instead of 10, and still the line was one kilometer long once the tree was cleared, then the jam would propagate 30 kilometers from that tree over a course of over three hours from when the tree was cleared. Now the line would not be that long, but it would propagate that far backwards like a wave as people arrived at the back while others drove away from the front. As in it would take three hours for that front line to catch the back. Think about that. A tree could fall on a road, be picked up not even seven minutes later, and cause over three hours of traffic that would move 30 kilometers from where that initial event happened. So if this event happened in Los Angeles and someone left from San Diego at the same time the tree was finally cleared, that person leaving would still hit the traffic caused by that event several hours later too. And at 30 cars per minute, theoretically the traffic jam would never dissipate until the traffic flow slowed down or people reacted faster. So there's an overly simplistic analysis of how traffic works. When engineers design a building, there's obviously a lot of work that goes into it. Like there's even people in charge of analyzing the soil that the building will rest on top of. Because when there's not, well, we've seen what happens. But now question is how do skyscrapers even stand up when we've clearly seen how unstable structures become as height increases, which you can see if you just stack a bunch of books on top of each other. Well, the thing is, as height increases, the center of mass of that stack moves up. If all the books had the same weight, then it'd be in the dead middle and there's always a gravitational force applied at that point. 
So if there's even a slight tilt in the structure, this will actually apply a torque about the balance point. So as the structure height increases and that center of mass moves up, it will become easier and easier for that structure to tip over. But when it comes to buildings, they actually start far beneath the ground. Typically a large hole is dug and filled with dense concrete where the main support beams are driven into. This portion, as well as the lower sections of buildings, are really heavy. In fact, sometimes the center of mass of a building is beneath the surface, and this distribution of weight almost removes any risk of toppling from wind or earthquakes. But buildings do not stay perfectly still, even in strong winds. They're subject to swaying. In fact, people living on top floors can experience feelings of seasickness. There are ways engineers can reduce this though, and this is actually a big deal in structural design. For example, some buildings use tuned mass dampers to reduce mechanical vibrations. This is a picture of one in the Taipei 101 located in Taiwan. This thing weighs 660 tons, which is about 20 fully loaded 18-wheeler trucks, or about 8,000 of me. So yeah, it's really heavy, but significantly reduces the chance of collapse due to strong wind or an earthquake, as you can see here. But another solution is to use slosh tanks. Yes, just huge tanks of water placed at the top of buildings can reduce vibrations. This is because when a force is applied to a tank of water, the water itself applies a resultant force in the other direction. So when placed at the top of a building, once the building starts to sway to the right, let's say, the water will slosh to the left and apply a restoring force to stabilize the structure. If you hold a chain or a rope at both ends and just let it hang, what shape will it make? You may think it makes a parabola, which was the assumption at one point in time. But in fact, it makes a different shape, one with this equation, which is also a hyperbolic cosine curve. This is known as a catenary. If you turn the shape upside down, you get the shape of many arches found around the world. And this is used because of how forces are distributed throughout the arch as a result. Next, if you're ever asked in an interview why manhole covers are round, the correct answer is because no matter how you orient them, they won't fall through, unlike many other shapes. But if there's a follow-up question of what's another shape that can accomplish this, then you can really impress them by saying they're a low triangle. This is a shape formed from the intersection of three circular discs along an equilateral triangle. The shape can be seen in architecture or certain types of machinery, for example. It's useful in machinery since it can reach into corners due to its ability to rotate within a square. Next up, if you want to throw a baseball as far as possible, you may think you should throw it at a 45 degree angle. But this is incorrect. That's only for when the ball will start and end at the same height. When you throw an object at some arbitrary height, this is in fact the equation for the optimal angle. As the height of the release point increases, the optimal angle decreases from 45 degrees. So if you want to optimize your shot put throw, the optimal release is around 42 degrees, but also know that this depends on the release speed. This next thing is probably something you've never thought of, but if you were looking at a large statue, where would you have to stand for optimal viewing? As in, where should you be such that the angle between the line connecting you and the bottom of the statue and you and the top of the statue is a maximum? Well, using some optimization, we find the optimal distance is the square root of the distance from the ground to the bottom of the statue times the distance from the ground to the top of the statue. This is also known as the geometric mean of those distances. So as an example, for the Statue of Liberty, according to its measurements, you should stand 216 feet or about 66 meters away. And lastly, if you're curious about things like collision reconstruction, the Coriolis effect, the physics of beam and truss bridges, and plenty more, then check out Brilliant, who I'd like to thank for sponsoring this video. A lot of content you saw here was pulled from their site under their Physics of the Everyday course, which reveals many more ways you can use math and physics to understand the world around you. Brilliant is a platform that not only teaches you new concepts within a wide variety of math and science subjects, but also challenges you with constant practice problems along the way. These problems really test whether you understand the underlying math and science, but what I really like about them is they very often show unique or real-world uses of the technical topics you go over. I honestly do learn a lot of new information every time I go through a course on their site for a video. Like the bike tracks problem was probably my favorite thing I learned for this one, but there's way more on the site for you to learn as well. Additionally, the first 200 people to sign up by clicking the link below or going to brilliant.org slash major prep will receive 20% off their first annual premium subscription. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. 
If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything. Hit that bell if you're not getting notified, and I'll see you all in the next video.